what uh, impels me to talk to groups like this is uh, the conviction that uh, a major aspect of what it means to be a human being has received short shrift in our civilization for at least a couple of millennia and that to some degree the solution to the uh, mega crisis that is bearing down on Western institutions is to be found in a revivifying of uh, the archaic. And this takes many different kinds of forms. It's nothing to do with what is popularly presented as the New Age. It's, to my mind, a much larger and deeper and persistent phenomenon than that. In fact, the entire intellectual tone of the 20th century can be seen as a groping toward a recapturing of this archaic mentality. This is what psychoanalysis was about. This is what cubism, surrealism, and uh, in the political uh, zone, negative phenomena such as national socialism. All of these various intellectual concerns to my mind can be traced back to a kind of unconscious nostalgia for the archaic. Now, when a society feels itself to be in crisis, the unconscious response is to look back into time to attempt to find a previous model that seemed to work and then to crystallize energy around that model in a def in an effort to reorient society. The last time this happened was with the breakup of the medieval stasis of the pseudo-eschatology of Christianity, and out of that chaos and that sense of disconnectedness came classicism. In other words, people were looking back into time for a serviceable model that could step in to the vacated shoes of the discredited medieval church. And what they came up with was uh, Platonic philosophy, Roman law, the aesthetics that ruled Periclean Athens, and so forth. And to a degree, we are still living in the twilight of that return to classicism but it no longer serves. And in its place is this inchoate groping for a, a yet another historical <coughs> paradigm that can somehow be contextualized in the late 20th century and give meaning to the experience that is coming, is sweeping over the world. Now, to my mind, uh, the Freudian breakthrough, what the Surrealists were doing, what the Abstract Expressionists were doing, the replacement of phonetic alphabet, linear print culture by electronic media that has happened over the last 25 years. These things are all well and good, but they are insufficient because once you begin to zero in on the notion of the archaic, mentality and what it really means, you discover that at the center of it is, God forbid, the psychedelic experience. Now, the psychedelic experience is as much a part of life as birth, death, making love, eating, conniving, so forth and so on, except in this particular kind of culture that has evolved out of Western European traditions. Why this is, is a very complicated question. Many factors bear on it. But what I would like to talk about this evening is just offer you a model of history, how we got into the dilemma that we're in and what we might be able to do about it. So I will tell uh, my version of the story of human emergence. And it goes like this. 
At some time in the past, experts vary, but the numbers are in millions of years. The adaptation of advanced primates to the canopy uh, ecosystems of the climaxed rainforests of the African continent was disrupted by the cycles of desertification that periodically affect the planet. And this has the effect of forcing these primates out of their arboreal niche and into evolving grasslands. Now, to my mind, the important point in the argument that I'm about to put forward is the idea that the previously unidentified factor impinging on human evolution and shaping the evolution of our species was tertiary mutagenic constituents of the human diet as we made the shift from a specialized fruit eating diet to an omnivorous diet that included meat. Most animal species have a very limited repertoire of acceptable foods. This is reasonable because it's a strategy for avoiding contact with mutagenic tertiary compounds that may be elaborated by plants. But when a species comes under pressure, it has to expand what it considers acceptable dietary constituents. And at that point, the organism uh, is subject to mutagenic influence because testing in the diet is bringing the body in contact with all kinds of toxic compounds, tumor-producing compounds, compounds which interfere with the endocrine system, compounds which are neuroactive, compounds which uh, uh, affect fertility. This has never really been discussed by evolutionary biologists as perhaps a critical factor in the emergence of the human species. My scenario goes something like this. These, pack these primates already had a fairly complex linguistic repertoire because they had developed a pack signaling system in the treetops. They transposed this system into uh, hunting bands or carrion gathering bands that were following along behind the large herds of ungulate mammals that were simultaneously evolving in this African environment. And in that situation, they came upon uh, coprophytic, means dung-loving fungi that were occurring Coincidentally, coincidentally with the presence of these evolving ungulate animals. Now, at that point, the stage was set for what I believe is the greatest leap that organic organization has made probably in the last hundred million years. And there was nothing miraculous about it. Psilocybin, which is the psychoactive amine that occurs in these mushrooms, was studied by Roland Fisher in the 1950s. And the first thing he learned was that small doses of psilocybin, doses so small as to be undetectable as an actual uh, experience, nevertheless uh, confer improved visual acuity. And he did elaborate tests on thousands of graduate students. In other words, you see better if you take small amounts of this drug. And Fisher said to me, in his wonderful Viennese accent, you see, this is a situation in which you actually have a better picture of reality if you take a drug than if you don't take a drug. And he had the data to back him up. Well, you don't have to be an evolutionary biologist to realize that a constituent of the diet which improves visual acuity in an animal that is surviving through its hunting skills is quickly going to be inculcated as an extremely favorable adaptation. Now, when, you, when slightly larger doses of psilocybin are uh, ingested accidentally or deliberately, the immediate effect is increased arousal, this is, and that includes sexual arousal. 
And this is typical for the bioactive amines. So what you begin to see is here is a constituent of the diet whose, whose first effect is to make those who use it more effective hunters, whose second effect is to uh, increase instances of what primatologists call successful copulations. <laughs> oh, yes, indubitably. And, and the, co the, the combination of increased sexual activity on the part of those animals admitting this constituent into their diet becomes, it becomes a kind of reciprocal feedback loop. Now, at yet higher doses, uh, psilocybin flowers out into a profound hallucinogenic experience. It's uh, so profound that, in truth, it is utterly confounding to 20th century human beings. We have no metaphors for this. We can't take its measure. We prefer to turn away from it. This is our cultural response to the presence of this dimension. But the idea that it is in, in any way understood or uh, its implications have been assimilated is absurd. Now, I believe that what we have here is, in this pre-historical uh, situation, is an incipient symbiosis. And I want to make clear what I mean here. I am not suggesting that there was a true symbiosis between human beings and mushrooms, uh, because a true symbiosis requires millions of years to be established and is actually almost a genetic bonding of two species. But it was an incipient symbiosis. Given enough time, it might have turned into a true symbiotic relationship. Unfortunately, it was disrupted by the very forces which had created it, which was a further exacerbation of this climatological aridity which was overtaking the African continent. So the notion is that these biogenically active amines acted as a kind of catalyst on the evolving uh, neurophysiological organization of these primates. One of the most interesting effects of psilocybin is that it seems to stimulate the language forming capacity. This has been remarked upon by writers such as Henry Munn and Gordon Wasson. I mean, it is literally true that the mushroom shaman is a man of language. It, is, it seems to facilitate a kind of release of the logos. And this linguistic facility, which marks, which is the great watershed in the evolution of our species out of animal organization, has never been satisfactorily explained. There had to be a catalyst for it. And I'm suggesting that in this early situation, this catalyst was this self-reinforcing cycle where uh, uh, group sexuality, visual acuity, frequent copulation, and a devotion to ecstatic trance all combined to create an entirely different psychology, a psychology in which the ego barely existed. The, it's almost as though you could say psychedelic drugs are an inoculation against the formation of the narcissistic ego. Now, why should this be? It's because, operationally speaking, what these psychoactive compounds do, not if you look at one trip, but if you look at thousands of people's trips and say, what is the common denominator of these experiences? What they do is they dissolve boundaries. And this is what gives them their power, and it's what makes them so controversial because the dissolution of boundaries is something around which we have profound anxiety, both as individuals 
and our institutions are even more anxious about this. Any uh, compound or dietary constituent which dissolves the boundaries between human beings poses a profound problem for the kinds of social organization that we have been familiar with throughout recorded history. As the drying of the African continent continued, the, this orgiastic communal use of the mushroom uh, became less and less frequent, simply because the mushroom itself was less and less available. Ultimately, I believe, there's evidence to suggest that honey was discovered as a method for preserving mushrooms through periods of scarcity. And it's still done this way in Mexico. However, there's a profound problem here. Honey itself can serve, after it has gone through chemical changes involving fermentation, it itself becomes a psychoactive compound. It becomes crude alcohol. And if your mushroom supply fades slowly enough and there isn't sufficient attention paid to what's going on, over a couple of millennia, a, an egoless, ecstatic, mushroom-using cult can turn into, essentially, a cult of alcohol. And the, the psychology of an alcohol cult is entirely different from the cult the, the psychology of a psilocybin cult. Around 12,000 years ago, <coughs> people began moving out of Africa and uh, settling in the Middle East, in Palestine. Before that time, the stratigraphic record in Palestine indicates that it was very uh, sparsely populated. But these new people appeared, called Natufayans, and there's considerable argument about where they came from. The general assumption is that they came from the area that, that Maria Gambutis calls Old Europe. But this is really based simply on the belief that they were so advanced that they couldn't possibly have come from anywhere else. When in fact, an analysis of the, of the wall paintings of these people and an analysis of uh, the pottery seems to indicate that they came from Africa, that these were African peoples. Uh, they, at first, they settled under the lips of, uh, you know, under rock escarpments. This is exactly the settlement pattern that we see in the Tesseling Niger Plateau in Algeria, where there are actually paintings on the rock walls dated to 7,000, 8,000 BC, where we see shamans with mushrooms sprouting out of their bodies, thousands of them. Now, this mushroom-using uh, culture established itself in Palestine at Jericho. And Jericho, at its triumph, was the most advanced civilization in the world. The tower at Jericho was by all measures the most sophisticated culture of its time. Later, these same people uh, settled at Chattal Yuyuk in southern Turkey. Chattal Yuyuk is 3,500 years in advance of any other civilization on Earth at that time. The chief investigator of the site, James Mallard, called it a premature flash of complexity and brilliance, and it disappeared mysteriously. <laughs> the motifs may have been transferred to, to Crete, but as far as we can tell, that was the last vestige of this psychedelically motivated partnership society, and it was destroyed by the Kurgan invaders, the wheeled chariot people who came from north of the Black Sea with an entirely different psychology. You see, their psychology was shaped by the domestication of the horse, which was a permission for a, um, a raiding psychology, a psychology of nomadic plunder. 
while the domestication of cattle in Africa some 5,000 years before had created the opportunity for this goddess mushroom cattle kind of psychology to evolve. Now these people were living, the, the, the mushroom using peoples of the ancient Middle East and, and of pre-desert Africa were living in a dynamic equilibrium with the environment. This was the Edenic state. I mean, if you, if you read the story of Genesis carefully, it is clearly the story of a drug bust. It is clearly the story of a woman's transgressions. And Yahweh, walking in the garden, says to himself, if they eat of the tree, they will become as we are. There's no shilly-shallying about, about this. What was at stake here was whether or not human beings should claim a stake of, in Godhead. And the decision was made that they should not, and they were cast out of Eden, and an angel was set at the gate of Eden with a burning sword so that they could not find their way back. This is the story of continual centuries of continual drought shattering the back of a partnership civilization that was at equilibrium in Central Africa 15 to 25,000 years ago. Now we are the sad inheritors of this situation. The mystery survived in a very attenuated form for several millennia in Crete. And Crete then became the bastion of the mystical impulse in, Hellen in Hellenistic religion at um, the mysteries at Eleusis, for example. What it, it, the ancient author said, what was practiced secretly at Eleusis was practiced openly at Gnosis. And there's considerable evidence that the mushroom cult may have persisted a long time in Crete. These puzzling so-called aniconic pillars that are uh, erected in the center of many of the rooms of the palace at Kenosis seem very much to argue that there was a memory of this ancient religion. The, the linear B tallies on opium use yielded such high numbers when translated that the early <coughs> assumption was that the glyph for opium must be the glyph for wheat. Now it's understood that this is not the case, and it is true that the twilight of Minoan religion was an opiated twilight. My belief is, you see, that our proclivity for drug use, this itch that we can never scratch, which really places us in a completely different category from the rest of animal organization, and I'm perfectly aware that elephants intoxicate themselves on papayas and all that malarkey. But those animals that have intoxic preference for intoxicants usually prefer one or two. We have scoured the biosphere for drugs of all sorts. And a drug that was used 200 years ago by five or 6,000 people can probably be bought within minutes. Uh, if you walk out of this building, because the news spreads. We have an absolute <coughs> obsession with the alteration of consciousness. And I believe it's because we are in a state of, um, I don't know, call it trauma, denial. We as a species <coughs> are the victims <coughs> of a dysfunctional childhood. We were torn from that which gave life meaning by climatological and cultural factors which forced us then into the nightmare of history. And it is from that nightmare that we must awaken or the lethal momentum of egocentrism is going to shove us right over the edge. The ego is like a calcareous tumor on the personality of each of us. This tumor must be psycholytically removed. It must be dissolved. Not that we must have no ego. After all, when you take someone to dinner, you want to know whose mouth to put food in. 
But the big ego that flowers out beyond the operational need to identify with a single body is an entirely maladaptive response. And we're sick with it through, through, and through. No less a uh, bastion of conservative and establishment thinking than Arthur Kessler in his book, The Ghost and the Machine, <coughs> finally concludes, you know, we have to have a drug which, uh, which inhibits the territorial impulse. That was when the territorial impulse was a big buzzword. But what he meant was, we have to interfere with the ego. It's completely unnecessary. It's a burden to everyone who has it, and the collective impact of it is absolutely thanatoptic. So the archaic revival is a, an impassioned and unconsciously driven reaching back into time. No, the Renaissance won't do it. No, the Greek ideas are not sufficient. No, Pharaonic Egypt isn't enough. No, 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 until finally we reach the brink of the last glaciation. And there we find people who are functioning. Their fertility levels, their uh, supply and demand relationship with their environment, all this is working. Now, it's easy to object uh, to the notion that an adaptation that worked for nomadic herders 15,000 years ago has any relevance to today's problem. The fact of the matter is, it is the psycholytic effect on ego that makes it necessary to take the psychedelic experience extremely seriously because we want to live. We want to turn off the series of lethal uh, cascades that seem to be leading toward a, a very heart-stopping conclusion, which is that this is a sinking submarine and that we cannot get out unless we change our minds. There's no question that we have the resources, the intelligence, the infrastructure to save our neck. But do we have the sense to change our mind? It is the mind that is intractable. And into our hands has then been placed this tremendously powerful tool, which our institutions immediately leap upon and attempt to stigmatize, drive underground, criminalize, and discredit, but they have a vested interest in the continuing momentum of all of this insanity. Okay, so that's a, a kind of a political argument for why this is a very good thing, and I trust I've convinced you all. Now I want to say something different about it, which appeals more, I think, to us, not as political animals, but as dreamers and uh, philosophers. And that is, people have not been straight with each other about how weird these psychedelic experiences are. Uh, this stuff is absolutely confounding. Uh, it is not sensory distortion. It is not delusion of reference. It is not recovery of traumatic material from the personal past. All of these psychoanalytic models fail utterly because ultimately the psychedelic experience hardly seems to be addressing the personality of the individual. Rather, it is some kind of insight into a tremendum before which we are as helpless as the herders of Africa of 35 millennia ago. We don't understand what it is. We haven't got a clue. We believe in matter, causality, the here and now, 
the discreteness of objects, the unknowability of the future, and so forth and so on. I mean, it's just a laundry list of wrong-headed notions <coughs> that you can immediately disabuse yourself with of with five grams of dried mushrooms. I mean, it is the Gordian knot of all of these philosophers, or it is the sword of Damocles cutting the Gordian knot of these philosophical uh, conundrums. Um, so then we line up on two sides. People who say, well, it's not natural, and it's psycho it, it, it induces psychosis, and so forth and so forth. This is all nonsense. This is our birthright. It is profoundly our birthright in the same way that our sexuality is our birthright. The notion that a person would call themselves intelligent and aware and present in the world and that they would go from the cradle to the grave without ever having a psychedelic experience is nothing short of obscene. It's absurd. It makes my flesh crawl in the same way that celibacy and virginity make my flesh crawl. What a horrible, horrible waste of a human life. You know, the Muslims used to say of the city uh, Isfahan in Iran at its architectural height that it was half the world. Isfahan is half the world. The psychedelic experience is half the world. If you don't have this under your belt, you don't know what's going on. You haven't got a clue about what's going on. And uh, it's not a big deal. You don't have to sweep up around my ashram for 15 years before I'm going to put the whammy on you. It requires nothing more than a personal act of courage to discover whether or not what I'm saying is true or horseshit. You know, you just have to go and look. And people want to talk about it. They want to argue about it. This is not a philosophy or a theory or a position. This is an experience. It's an experience. And, you know, talking to people who have not taken psychedelics and trying to convince them of the worth of it is like trying to talk a nine-year-old boy out of his aversion to sexuality. You know, he knows that it's a bad thing and should be stayed away from. But we... Uh, who have found ourselves by hook or by crook in positions of prominence and influence I cannot have the luxury of this kind of know-nothing attitude. If the expansion of consciousness does not loom large in the history of the human species, then in the future of the human species, then what kind of future is it going to be? Now, these compounds were originally just given a phenomenological description. They were called consciousness-expanding drugs. We must investigate this possibility. If there were only a thousand to one chance that it was so, it would still merit intense investigation by the scientific community and everyone else with an interest in it. And yet, it's fairly clear that these things do expand consciousness, that they do promote insight, that they do catalyze the release of ideas into society, that they do diminish the ego, that they do provide real insight into the functioning of things that then allows everything to move more smoothly toward a reasonable conclusion. So, it's incumbent upon anyone who is concerned about the fate of the earth, their own well-being, so forth and so on, to investigate these things. We cannot allow a frightened and constipated establishment to control this agenda. And I am perfectly aware that there is a drug problem. There is a terrible drug problem. I mean, uh, but it's a different problem. It's not a problem caused by people who are seeking expanded or higher consciousness. It is caused by people who are blotting out 
how the consequences of living in this kind of civilization make them feel. And we need a mature dialogue in which each drug is dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis, and we examine the social consequences, the risk-benefit picture, and then commit ourselves to those uh, compounds and courses of action that seem promising. It is an absolute disgrace that science has tolerated the intrusion of small-minded politicians into what is traditionally its bailiwick. Doctors are being are allowing the government to tell them what compounds they may or may not investigate. Where is the AMA on this? How can we tolerate the least informed among us controlling the agenda when the agenda deals with the question of planetary survival. Now I see myself, uh, I used to think of myself as simply a cunning linguist, but now I realize that I'm actually a meme replicator. A meme, as I'm sure you all have been told many times, is the smallest unit of an idea that still has coherency. Memes are to ideas what genes are to proteins. And my notion in coming here tonight is to replicate the mean, to give permission to discuss this. And what I think should be kept center stage in thinking about this is the depth of the mystery, the mysteriousness of it, how confounding it is. I mean, there are psychoactive drugs in use in shamanic contexts, which when purified and, and smoked, for instance, give experiences the duration of which is only minutes. <coughs> and yet these experiences are such a profound uh, dissolution into another dimension that they seem to imply that we have moved hardly off the dime in terms of getting a grip on the real nature of reality. Uh, one of the things that I find very interesting, I said in the early part of this talk that psilocybin synergized language and I described how it synergized consciousness in this early African situation, but it continues to act. It's acting even as we speak. And what it seems to be holding out to those who have explored it at depth are things like uh, an ontological transformation of the basis of language. For instance, uh, language seems to become something visible. You know, Philo Judeus, writing about the Logos, said he, he, he was concerned with what he called the more perfect Logos. As you all know, the Logos was an informing voice that was um, the sine qua non of Hellenistic spirituality. And when you got right with the world, this voice opened in your head and informed you and guided your actions. So Philo Judeus is talking about the, the more perfect Logos. And he says, the more perfect Logos would go from being heard to being be held without ever crossing over a, a quantized moment of transition. This actually happens on psilocybin. The <coughs> project of communication, which in ordinary reality devolves down into the generation of small mouth noises, which move across space to be decoded inside private minds using what we hope are congruent dictionaries can potentially be replaced by a logos beheld, a thing seen. The clue to this is that in our own language, our notion of linguistic facility is always backed up by visual metaphors. We say, he spoke clearly. I see what you mean. She painted the picture. This is saying that at unconscious levels, our notion of truth is rooted in the visual. And I believe that uh, 
the evolution that, in, in a sense, history is a psychedelic experience. We are unfolding endlessly into the consequences of the contact with the tremendum that raised us to self-reflection 25 or, or 30,000 years ago. And the question then becomes, how do we make sense of this in the future? What kind of world incorporates these kinds of insights? Well, I believe that the place to lean is on a new modality for language, that syntax properly understood is beheld. It's very interesting to me that the most powerful of these hallucinogens are also endogenous neurotransmitters. DMT, without contest, is the most terrifyingly powerful hallucinogen that exists in nature, and it occurs in the human brain as a normal part of human metabolism. The fact that the experience only lasts a few minutes is a profound statement about the brain's ability to identify and, and uh, render inactive these compounds. I mean, the brain is hit by a wave of DMT and it says, I know what this is and we can shunt this to indolacetic acid and excrete it in a matter of minutes. So this, this state is not far away from us. It could be as little as a one or two gene mutation away. The pineal gland is generating adenoglomerotropine this is an MAO inhibitor of the beta carboline class, very similar to the compounds that occur in ayahuasca and yahe. It appears that the chemistry of thought and the chemistry of shamanic ecstasis are simply uh, points on a continuous spectrum. So, to my mind, this is the great untold secret of our civilization. To not know about this is to be absolutely in the dark about what is going on and how many people do know. Some of you may know a story by the Argentine poet uh, Jorge Luis Borges, a story called The Cult of the Phoenix. And he says there, there is a cult its practitioners have suffered in every pogrom in history. Its practitioners have participated in every pogrom in history. It honors no class, no race, no place, no time. One child may initiate another. Ruins are propitious places. The initiate do not speak of it. And to some it seems absurd. What he is describing is the fact that in this world of ours, there is in fact an umbilical knot. There is in fact a blind spot that we have all overlooked, or many people have overlooked. The people in this room, I assume, are an exception. But the fact of the matter is that if you search far enough, if you look, in the oldest places, the densest jungles, if you talk to the least assimilated tribes, sooner or later you are going to confront the psychedelic experience. And at that point, your relationship to reality becomes very different from that of everyone around you. Because everyone around you is searching for the answers. The task of the person who, by one means or another, has found their way to the psychedelic experience is to face the answer. The answer is found. We have arrived at the end of the road in terms of a powerful tool for inducting us into what Wittgenstein called the realms of the unspeakable. We need no more powerful tools than what we have inherited from these shamanic cultures. It's a question, pure and simple, of courage, of having the guts to use it, of surrender. And of course, it had to be that, because surrender requires the abandonment of the ego. And it is the ego's house of cards that is entirely at risk 
if we begin to look more deeply uh, at the psychedelic experience. So it is a challenge for the society. It is a challenge for the individual. It is, it, you are not an ingenue if you have arrived at this place in the spiritual quest. Now the tools and the information are put into our hands and it's up to us to decide what we're going to do with it and how we're going to apply it. And uh, the evidence that this is our birthright, that this is what we came from and yearn to return to is all around us. It's mm -hmm. that it has been suppressed by a male-dominated, phonetic alphabet, yak, yak, yak kind of culture, which we are all unquestionably embedded in. But, you know, I can't stress enough, the consequences of not taking this seriously are, I believe, the death of the planet. I don't think that through exhortation and preaching and legislation and manipulation through propaganda that we're going to get people to do what must be done in order to set this ship right. They are going to have to be touched by the tremendum. And I scoured India and sat with these Roshis and Rishis and Geishis and Gurus and went through the whole nine yards. And as far as I'm concerned, it's a, it's a skin game. You know, they're standing in for the real thing. The real thing is the felt presence of immediate experience. And that's what this is giving back to us. It is putting you back into your place and your time <coughs> with the knowledge now that there is a goal, there is reason to hope, there is something to say. The inner richness of the human being causes everything else to pale by comparison. I could loot Madison Avenue to my heart's content and furnish my apartment, and it would be as garbage compared to the inner richness of the mind of one of these Mexican or Amazonian shame. We have to find our way back to the authenticity of the body and to the connection to the vegetable matrix of the planet. We are not apart from nature, but we are if we cut off our channels of communication to it. And I don't mean this in some airy-fairy way. I mean that if you are not embedded in the use of the plant hallucinogen, there is no way for you to get your instructions in the larger dance of what is happening because the guy in mind, the oversoul, whatever you want to call it, this is how it controls the global megasystem through the shedding and release of chemical messengers of all sorts that move all kinds of organisms around, including self-reflecting higher organisms. Well, I think you get the drift. <laughs> Why don't we knock off? <laughs> now you can bring out the knives. <laughs> Bravo. Bravo. Bravo.